No, really, really, hold your applause, hold your applause. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> no, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, for doing nothing, I appreciate it. Um, so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna have a TED style presentation format. Um, this is not a TEDx event, it's not a TED-ed event. We'll make that perfectly clear. Um, it's, a, it's a style of presentation. So just so you kind of know, everybody's gonna come up, they have a topic uh, that they're gonna, they're gonna discuss and they're gonna work in a product they've been working on for the last seven weeks to a month. Um, so then after that, we're gonna have a showcase in the interactive media um, work center. So that's what's gonna happen. Uh, I'm gonna be timing them in the back. They're gonna be practicing that format. First time any of them have actually gone up and done this on stage. So uh, I think you're gonna be pleasantly surprised at the range of topics and at the level uh, that the presentations will be at. All right, so with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to the first presenter because you're not here to hear me talk. You're here to hear these people talk. So first up is Connor Morgan, putting the movie theater on trial. So I always like to start all of my presentations off with a quote. So today I decided to start one off from my mother because she's the number two inspiration in my life. Number one, that would have to be movies. So what we're going to get into today is the people who show you these movies, these, these wonderful things that I love, are also taking it and just ripping away all the dignity that it has, ripping away your dignity as well. So. What is the movie theater guilty of exactly? It's guilty of first degree murder of your movie going experience. And by that I mean they ruin your experience. So, exhibit A, what does the movie theater do to you? Well first they take your money, okay? Now I go to the movies, I've been going to the movies since I was 12 years old. And I've been going to the movies since I was 12 years old. And I can remember a time when it was about like $12 for me to get into a movie, get snacks, get candy, and all sorts of stuff like that. However, nowadays, you go, you spend $30, you're on a date, you spend 60 bucks. Also, it's like television. Like the only thing that really stops the movie theaters from being television these days is the fact that there's no commercial break in the middle of the movies. Exhibit B, the people that you're in the theaters with. Now these people, are, uh, they're loud, they're obnoxious, they talk on their phones, they spill things, they throw things. I've never been a violent person, but like, I swear every time I hear a baby cry in the movie theater, I want to just like, pun it, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> in the defense of the movie theaters, I didn't have a terrible time going to movie taverns. Now it has the couple of good things from movie theaters, like the reclining chairs, but you're already spending $40 going to movie tavern, but you're getting a meal out of it instead, so it's a little bit better. Now we're going to talk about some alternatives, some witnesses, some people who have seen the things that movie theaters have done and they have uh, they've taken those things and changed them to their own benefit. So who knew there was a movie festival last weekend? Did anyone know? So there was a movie festival in New Orleans and it shows, really movie festivals are to show all those Oscar nominated movies that you hear about at the end of the year that you've never heard of before, but they show them all your because they were actually made in 2017. And so you can go to these and you can be there with these people who actually care about movies. They'll sit there, they'll be quiet, everything's great. So witness two, who in here uses Netflix? Hulu? Anyone got a fire stick? So what happens is these things, and if you have the fire stick you can get all this on one thing, but these products actually care about your experience. And by that I mean Netflix, when you go on Netflix and you click on something, it immediately registers as, oh, it like, this person likes this kind of, of movie or TV show and they like this kind of cover art. And then Hulu does the same thing. And you can get like a fire stick and have all these things on one thing. So it actually cares about like what, uh, it actually cares about what you think because they want you to spend more money on it. Every month it's $10. So is the movie theater guilty? 
that would be up to you. You're the people that have to go and spend money at these movie theaters. However, a student at the Satellite Center created a new business plan for a new kind of movie theater called the Cinema Truck. So what this is, is it's a food truck that's also a mobile movie theater. So what you do is you walk up to the window, you get your food, and they pass you a code. And this code will let you into the app. And so you can scroll through all sorts of different kinds of movies, just like Netflix, but it'll also be like movies in theaters. So this would be like, at a public event, you could watch it on your phone. Now, if it's a private event, that's different, because they also have a screen, and so you, then you get to just pick the movies, and you can watch these movies there. So, as you can see, movie theaters, there's a lot of evidence stacked against it, and uh, I hope that you people, the jury, will find movie theaters guilty. Thank you. Next presenter is Bill Miliot, Bud Through the Ages. So when I was young, I loved making things. It's always been something I've always loved to do. And I tried out every single medium that I could throughout my whole life. Different things I could try to make, try to make with. And one thing that I started with when I was really little and have continued to, because I love it, is clay. And I tried making little characters, little things from movies. And one of those things that has kind of stuck with me to this day is but. He is a little character I made. He's not the most complicated thing in the world, but he's cool. He's my little bud. I've had him for, I, I made him when I was 10, so seven years now. And he's kind of stuck with me. As I've progressed from medium to medium, I've kind of tried him out. Whenever I went to Photoshop, I made him like this. And then after that, I made him like this in After Effects. I wanted to do an animation with him. So I always decided anytime I tried a new medium, he would be my starting point. He would be where I can go from. And so we started talking about this, and I thought, OK, awesome. So I've been wanting to use this 3D printer we have all year. I've gotten to use it like once, and I knew I wanted to use that. So 3D printer, awesome. And then I wanted to use my sculpting. So who else to start it with besides Bud? So I started sculpting, and I started thinking about it, but I also didn't really know exactly how to 3D sculpt. So I had to go look at a whole bunch of different softwares I was trying to use, go from each one and each one, to figure out which one would work for which thing, and these were the final ones that I used by the end. And so I started out with this. This was my first ever completed model for Bud, for my new version of him. And it, it looks fine. It looks awesome. That is until it comes to the fact that I was using this really hard filament uh, plastic that w has no give to it at all. And all of it kind of ended up like that. So about three weeks down the drain, had to keep going, uh, kept moving, decided to redesign it, and went with this one. This was my newest one. This, I thought, awesome. I, I'm sure it will work. I changed out to a new filament that I thought was less brittle. It is called Ninja Flex, and it has a lot more give to it. It's very stretchy. But then I decided, yeah, let's actually try this first. Let's try out these joint systems, because that's never really worked out that well. So I printed the joints, and it looks so impressive. I know, very, very impressive, seeing it all right there. But that was a big stepping point. As soon as I saw that that worked, that meant that the whole entire thing would work. And it just, it launched it to a new level to where I knew I could actually do this. And it gave me a lot of reassurance for whenever I printed out my final version, which is him, or him. And, <laughs> and so I, I, and I just, it took me two months to get a final version that actually worked. And of course I can always make improvements, but it works. And so this 
is just the evolution. It just it astounds me of how far I've come. From 2010 to 2018, I've gone from making a little clay model to a fully 3D designed articulated model that I did myself, start to finish. No help from anyone but myself and a little bit of help from Mr. Golf occasionally with the actual 3D printer. But, and that's, I, I did not, I didn't know what else to do and I, I, I'm so glad that I actually made it. But as that goes, you can see from eight years, going from here to there, and the question is though, is where will we go next? I, I have thought about it and I just hope I can't wait to see the next time that bud pops up. So thank you very much. So when I was little, I had a big obsession with the Disney Channel and watching Disney movies in general. And you know, watch things like Lilo and Stitch and Finding Nemo like a hundred times over because I just, I found myself in the characters. But the problem I saw was that they were the only movies that I could really enjoy and actually connect with. And as I grew up, I also connected with other things, you know, like superheroes. Growing up, I turned into an avid comic book nerd, and uh, I got into TV shows like Iron Man, Arbor Adventures, and I'm in love with Spider-Man. But the problem with that also is that these two uh, have nothing in common with me, except one of them is a teenager, and I don't think I am a billionaire the I don't think I'm a, bil a billionaire that sells weapons and um, has a suit of armor and I don't have spider powers and that's about it. <laughs> so for children it's very easy for them to connect with characters that can reflect themselves even if they're in a medium that is not so realistic. But the thing is, is that there is a strong lack of representation for these kids. And that's extremely disappointing, especially in the era we're in right now. And the fact that there are no TV shows or movies that have like, well, there are movies like that, but there are very, there are very little movies. And what I'm trying to say is that it's extremely important for them to develop as an individual if they can see themselves in, you know, above average people. Like, you know, Black Panther or Wonder Woman. And shows like Steven Universe can rep have really good representation for that, but that's only one show. First of all, there is a shortage of females in movies and television. And the ratio of males to females in, um, in the media is about three to one. And looking at this picture, this is the most recent Marvel movie, looking at this picture, how many females do you see in this picture? Counting, I saw about six. I know there are more females in the movie, but then counting those up, I got to about Eight. <laughs> and there are about 20 males here, so that's fun. <laughs> and only 30% um, of all female characters have dialogue, and that's not fair. And then only 10% of movies featured a character, featured a character that was female. So the other problem that it came to was that, for some reason, directors find the need to put these girls in skimpy clothing. And it's also extremely upsetting whenever these girls are, ab 
are below the age of 18 because, you know, that's a minor and you shouldn't be sexualizing them because that's kind of illegal. <laughs> well, it's, it's illegal, but I'm not going to go there. Never mind. <laughs> and this is also very upsetting because there's a lack of females, there's also a lack of women of color. And so looking here, you can see that only 70% of movies have white people. And that's, that's not just in America. You can find actors worldwide. Like they hire British actors, like Tom Holland's British. We have a bunch of Toms in the uh, Marvel Universe. We have a bunch of, we have a bunch of um, Chris's in the Marvel Universe. But all of them seem to be the same kind of color, the same kind of build. And so the people of color are only stuck with the 30%. And right there, that's me, I'm the purple. Um, and so that's only 4% of everybody. So Drake, where's the equality? And then to make matters worse is that in movies, they tend to have this nasty habit of whitewashing. Like for Ghost in a Shell, the main lead is supposed to grow up in Japan, so she's Asian, right? Well, Scarlett Johansson doesn't look that Asian to me, so I'm kind of confused about that. And then I know Peter Pan isn't that great of a, uh, you know, cultural, cultural diverse, like, backgrounds and everything, and it's not the best example of what this could be. But, you know, like, at least hire an American actress to play a Native American person. And then I love Wilson, but honestly, you could have made him a scientist. That just doesn't make any sense to me. He's got street smarts, but what else? And then for my final and most sensitive topic, for some reason, is that they don't seem to put any LGBTQ people into media because people seem to be sensitive to that topic. But you know, Bugs Bunny can get shot at by the uh, baby hunter man and <laughs> nobody bats an eye at that. So that is why I made this character Supernova. And she's, ext she's a representation of what I want it to be and she's Latin American and black, and she also has an Asian sidekick, so that's fun. And so, that's the end. Next presentation is Harrison Thomas with Organized Sound. It's on? All right. <laughs> Thank you. Picture this. Normal everyday situations, changing in an instant, in the car, on the bus, at work, things changing just like that. How does this happen? What causes this? Sitting on a bus, looking out the window, watching street signs pass, loud kids in the back, not even noticing them, just ignoring them. An aura of good smelling food, joy, and companionship generating from behind a fence. Sweat and perseverance covered in it as you run down a path through the park. So what causes this? Music. Music drives us. It is all around us. It has been 
and always will be. The auditory cortex is responsible for the brain's ability to process music. And music also triggers emotions, movement, and memories. I have a quote from Jane Thomas, my grandmother. Your music, your art, your gift for design, along with your tech talents, makes for a potentially incredible future. My grandmother has always inspired me and she has always pushed me to pursue my passions throughout my life. And yeah, she holds a special place in my heart for that. And so I combined my passions for music and my computer skills and my talents, and I created a product, my P3 music player. My idea was to make something that I could play music on without having to tab out or wait for it to load in simple touch screen, just change it whenever I want, and that's all it's used for, just music. This is the Pi. It is a miniature computer, and that it can do everything that a normal computer does, but play like high-tech games and stuff. That's the CPU, the power supply, or power input, and the USB ports. Just very compact. How will I will use it? I will cut out a hole in my desk, and it fits right in there. And it'll just sit on top of my desk, and I can just reach over, change music, change the mood of my environment whenever I so desire. And it will change my music experience because it's just, it will be so easy to access and I don't have to worry about music buffering or anything like that ever again. Thank you. Let me tell you a story. The date, December 24th, 1914, World War I. It's five months since the beginning of the war, and already a million men are dead. It's Christmas Eve. All throughout the Western Front, gunshots, artillery shells, screaming, and death are heard. But soon, that sound starts to die down. A new sound replaces it. Stillnacht, Hilgenacht. The German version of Silent Night, Holy Night. A Christmas carol. The British hear this. They start to sing too. At first to spite the Germans. But then they start to harmonize. They start singing together. All throughout the front now, instead of the gunfire, instead of the artillery, the death, the destruction, there's music. Music replaced those horrible sounds. Christmas Day, the two opposing sides come out of their trenches and meet in the middle of no man's land. Not to fight, not to kill, and not to destroy each other, but to celebrate. Music stopped a war for two days. That's pretty powerful. Now, another thing that's pretty powerful is technology. During World War I, technology was geared towards killing your fellow man. That's power, yes, but not the right type of power that's needed. And I wanted to try to find a way to take these two powers and put it into a very great use. Take music, for example. Music is very inspirational. The power behind that is 
it can change things. It can take a deadly conflict where two bitter sides are just killing each other for no reason whatsoever and completely change it. There's inspiration behind technology. Technology can propel us further and further into the future as a society and as people. Now let me tell you another story about the donut. <laughs> we were celebrating the end of a project, the Teacher of the Year banquet that we have completed, and Mr. Goff got us donuts. And we were eating these donuts, we were enjoying ourselves, we were talking, we were joking, having a great time. And then Mr. Goff brought other things. He brought our supplies for our 20% project. Among those supplies was a VR headset, two Raspberry Pis, and the Makey Makey Kit. I got the Makey Makey Kit. And I started to play around with it, just look at it, observe it. And in a stroke of genius, I ran and grabbed a donut. I hooked up the kit to my computer, took the wires from the kit, and jabbed it into the donut, and made it. I started playing music on a donut. Now, everyone else in the room was preoccupied with their, their projects, mainly the VR headset, this new technological innovation, to notice this at first. Then, they start seeing me having a little fun with the donut. They all start crowding around, wanting to play with the donut. Soon kids from other classes came and wanted to play with the donut. Even outside of the Satellite Center, people who don't even come here have heard about the donut. That's pretty powerful. And I wanted to find a way to further that even more. So I did some research into combining music and technology, introducing this lady, Amogan Heap. She's pretty special because she took an Arduino board, some gloves, and motion sensors, and put it into a glove to where she moves her hand, and it makes music. I wanted to do, to do something like that, but a little bit simpler, introducing Jazz Hands. Jazz Hands is a very basic version of her design with some duct tape, tin foil, wires, and a plastic glove. And to where I can play the piano with just four of my fingers. Making jazz hands was fun as well. As you can see up there, I have my teammate Zachary Dominic taping my fingers with duct tape and tin foil. I used the Makey Makey kit for the transfer of the electronical signals from the glove to the computer to make the noise. This is the prototype. This is the final design. It took me all around two months to make this. And it was the best two months that I ever had making something. Now why did I do this? It's the big question, why? I wanted to really bring the greatness of technology and the awe-inspiring power of music and put it together to make something last, bring people together. Anyone can pick this up. Anyone can play with it. Anyone can play a song from it. And I want everyone to do that because it's what music's about. Everyone doing something, everyone making something. That's technology too. Thank you. So Elon Musk once said, I think we are at the dawn of a new era in commercial space exploration. His company itself has proven this by launching three rockets into space and the rockets themselves were able to bring themselves down and land almost exactly where it took off. So this is a big advance in technology because this would mean that the rockets could be reused and shot back in space or 
used in a different um, project. And since they were able to land themselves, it, it puts less stress on the pilots. Something else is NASA's TESS. The TESS stands for Transiting Exoplanet uh, Surveying Satellite. So what they did was build this and launch it into space, and it would orbit our solar system looking for other planets that either are inhabitable is the goal, or just other planets in general that we have yet to be able to find. Now, these, these advances in technology will help hopefully find another planet that we could habit and so we're not just limited to Earth. It also helps with other forms of technology such as our cars or phones that we use every day. So putting ourselves into perspective, just in our galaxy, there are 200 billion to 400 billion other stars. Stars being, for example, the sun. And they're just in our galaxy, there are 200 to 400 billion. Also in our, just our galaxy itself, 100 billion other planets that we have yet to find. And with numbers like that, just in our galaxy, there are an estimate of over either 200 billion or 2 trillion other galaxies with either more or less planets and stars that we have now. So you're probably wondering, how does any of this concern me? Well, eventually Earth will no longer be sustainable and we would have to leave. Take example, WALL-E, the animated movie. Humans no longer live there and they're living in space. Or take Interstellar, where the planet is dying and they're on their way to look for another planet. That we might soon have to begin doing that. Now, virtual reality. This could be another way to put ourselves into perspective. And virtual reality is normally used for games. It puts yourself into a game where you interact with the, the environment or like throwing pencils or books, flipping desks, whatever it is. It puts you in that area. So what I plan to do was make it more of an environment that you could view instead of interacting. So what it does is you stand in front of the, the sun and you would look side to side and you could view the planets orbiting. Now, when I put it into VR, it may just look like someone is just seamlessly looking around, not knowing what they're doing. But what they're really seeing is the sun and the stars around it, as well as the planets as they come in orbit around. Now, environment programs like mine that I have created could help us put more into perspective as to how small and how many planets they actually have in our solar system. Thank you. Next to present is Kat Champagne. She's going to be talking about the topic of exposure, exposing the light. There are two types of perfectionists. There's a good kind that'll change the way you think, that'll make you want to, your want to be perfect into bettering yourself in whatever you want to be perfect in. But there's also a bad kind. There's one that'll hide and throw away their work simply because it's not good enough. I'm guilty of this. So when I first started this project, I, was, I asked for advice from Dr. Beerus, uh, a Southeastern professor, and he told me it won't be perfect, so be sure to have fun with it. I was like, wait, what? Come again? One more time. Won't be perfect. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, not a, that's not good. How am I going to do a project where my art can't be perfect? I had, done, I had found my love for, for photography in this class. We did Battle on the River. We went to Wetland Watchers and took photography. And every time, it had this, this hint of being perfect, that perfect moment where it seemed that time had just stopped. Picasso in the 1950s was starting this. He did light painting, and while it doesn't look perfect, and you can see him in the photo, people loved his photography. 
He's well known, a lot of people know of him, and it's not perfect, so why should mine not be just as good even though it's not perfect? This is the first one I ever did. I was super excited when I had the chance to finally start my photography. I actually did it in that closet <laughs> over there. Um, so if, as you can see in this picture, there's a table. I didn't know that table was gonna be there until after the picture. Uh, so I was a little surprised to see it there. Uh, you may not be able to see it because of the lighting, but there's a little discoloration right there. Yep, that's, that's my school pants. That's when I found out you cannot wear light colored, colored clothing when you're taking these photos. But I also saw that one section right there where all the lines are solid, none of them are faded. Even though they're not equally spaced or even in the right direction most of the time and colliding, for some reason it held my attention. That fade off into darkness, it just it gave me a really good feeling about it. I used it on my business card that we made in class. Now, one thing that's really hard about this painting compared to regular painting is when you're painting on a canvas, you can see your borders. You're not painting off into, into nothingness. But when you're light painting, you're in front of a camera. You have no idea how far you can go, how high, how low, until you're not even in the picture anymore. My two little cousins, Emma and Charlie, they helped me out by being my models. They witnessed firsthand how big of a problem this was. This was one of hers, and if you can't really see, she's blurry. And a lot of the wing at the top is cut off. Another one where my cousin is kind of blurry, and some of it isn't even on the picture. This is where we took the pictures. All of these places, they're in a swamp in my grandfather's backyard. And a problem in the, the springtime is it's warm, and we're in a swamp. There's water. And one thing that comes with that is mosquitoes. Now, it's really hard to stay still for like 10 to 15 minutes to take a picture when there's mosquitoes coming at you in hordes all over you and you can't move a single muscle. Another one we did, well, I did, was I painted with steel wool. Now, I lit the wool on fire and I spun it around on a chain inside of a whisk. So very dangerous, thankfully I didn't catch myself on fire, so that was, a, that was a plus. Now I even saw some imperfections in this photo. It was kind of blurry. You can't really see, but I'm in it. Um, but there were these sparks at the bottom. You could see them bouncing off the grass, you could even see the grass, kind of. And I thought it was a really cool effect. Now I couldn't see these when I was actually doing the photo, but to see it afterwards was amazing. This was another photo I did a few days ago. Now, these are some white um, buttercups that were in my grandfather's backyard. When it was dark enough, I was able to light them with, the, uh, with a flashlight with some coloring over it. I went from white to pink to dark purple, and it just came out so nicely, even though it was so blurry. You can actually kind of see that there are flowers and that they are flowers. <laughs> I did a lot of light painting photos that not all of them were in the presentation, so I decided to make a slide for it. Um, but each one of them, I can tell you something wrong with it. There's always something I can point out that's not good enough, not perfect. But as in life, as in this painting, it, it's not gonna go as you plan. Nothing will go as you plan. You just have to learn to love how perfectly imperfect it all is. Thank you. Okay, let's imagine it's the 1950s. You're in a dead-end office job. You don't have much in the way of technological innovation. The most advanced piece of equipment in your cubicle may be a typewriter. And you think it's the bee's knees because it's, the, it's representative of what you've been exposed to. But little do you know that 
that same time period, there's advances happening in the world of computational technology. And fast forward to today, and these advances have come forward, and we've come full circle with uh, revolutions and interaction with computers, with computer graphics, and with networking between computers, even on different sides of the world. And yet, uh, back to our office environment, the way that we utilize these advances, we've essentially turn computers into fancy typewriters. We write Word documents on them, we'll send mail. And it's supplanted a lot of these traditional roles, but we've yet to find ways to take advantage of the advances in new and unforeseen ways. So I thought that maybe virtual reality, that's something that has not been feasible for the average consumer until very recently. Uh, it's something that I've personally had an interest in is one of the technological developments that is not very often utilized for non-entertainment purposes. You might see it in gaming, you might have the occasional VR movie, but we've yet to accept it into our lives the same way we might have accepted internet or television. And I wanted to do something to change that. What you see before you is a meticulous, real-time 3D recreation of the Interactive Media Work Center in virtual reality, but also, uh, also usable without VR. I tried to capture the details of the environment as best as I could. And you can move around slightly. I wanted to implement the ability to create objects, which gives you the ability to interact with your environment. It's all physics-based interactions, which was a very fun opportunity for me to explore. Uh, so your motion is limited in VR, so I opted to implement a teleportation-based locomotion to mitigate the effects of motion sickness. And you can see that you can intuitively move around the room and really immerse yourself in this virtual environment. You can also interact with objects that are pre-existing in the room, and you can see that they're responsive, and they're, it's, it really immerses you in this environment, and it goes to show you that maybe we're limiting the way that we think about technology, that, well, if we can do something like this, why aren't we doing it? A lot of companies, Microsoft is just one of them, have posited a number of scenarios in which we could leverage virtual reality but also augmented reality to revolutionize the ways that we interact with others, we interact with computers. And we can use these technologies to, to bridge boundaries that traditionally we have not been able to bridge even through internet, through email, we can use it to visualize data in a capacity that we've never been able to do before. And I think that that's something that's very exciting to see, especially considering I'm going to be part of it in the world of computer science. Bill Gates himself said that the advance of technology is based on making it fit in so that you don't even really notice it. It's part of everyday life. And I think that to a degree, we've seen that with, like I said, internet, television, uh, going back even further, radio. But I think it's important that just because we've gotten comfortable with the way we use computers and phones and such, that we don't limit ourselves and that we don't stop trying to seek out these revolutions and apply them in new and unforeseen ways. Thank you. All right, all right, we're ready to go. Uh, thank you for that standing ovation, I appreciate it. Um, there's nothing like pandering for applause. So, that's okay, I didn't do anything. Um, we're gonna 
get on with the program. So you're, you're really not up here to hear me talk today. So I'm going to keep this short and uh, just quickly explain the format of this presentation. So it's going to be, I want to make very clear, this is not a TEDx event or a TED-Ed event. This is a TED-styled event. So we're going to give presentations kind of in a TED style. Uh, we've been studying that a little bit. So you're going to see a variety of presentations on a variety of topics. We have eight presentations, each about six minutes, and um, then we're going to give them the hook if they go over. So if, if you hear them, uh, if you hear them kind of stop mid-sentence and say, and that's my presentation, it's probably because, uh, it's not because they forgot, it's because I'm telling them to stop uh, with the time. So with that said, we're going to move on to the first presenter of the day, and that is Mason Barney with the throwback machine. All right, how's everybody doing today? All right, so my name is Mason Barney. Uh, I have the throwback machine. We're going to take a look at this clip right here. This is a little bit of footage from uh, EA's FIFA 18, which is considered one of the most graphically advanced sport games out on the market right now. But uh, we're not worried about all that today. We're worried about this. Released in 1983 by Nintendo Donkey Kong, that was widely available on the original Nintendo Entertainment System and that many of you might have actually played in the arcades growing up. Very, very uh, highly graphical game, if you can't tell. So uh, let's take a trip back to the 80s. Uh, most of y'all probably grew up in this time period. Imagine yourself asking your mom for quarters every day, ask, trying to go to the arcade, play your favorite games like Galaga, Pac-Man, everything like that. Uh, Michael Jordan was just some pop culture. Michael Jordan was a very decent basketball player. Uh, you got Mr. T, you got all the Terminator, you got Ghostbusters, Run DMC. Everything was, in my opinion, a lot more fun in the 80s, even though I didn't actually get to experience it. One of the major parts that I fell in love with doing a bunch of research and everything were the arcades from the late 70s to the early 80s. I was very inspired by uh, all the cool artwork on each arcade machine, all the cool uh, graphic, not graphic, uh, color schemes that they chose, which kind of inspired me to create this actual product. So starting with my design, I kind of went for like a late 70s, early 80s, like Tron type of feel, like those sci-fi movies since everything was really big back then like that. I kind of went with a, uh, you see like kind of the Tron lights and everything, a little bit of the, uh, I guess you could say fluorescent lights, neon lights-ish with the font, which was really cool. You got kind of that cursive and the really bold, bright letters. So that really inspired me since I didn't actually get to enjoy all that stuff growing up. But the computer itself that I actually house everything on is called a Raspberry Pi. Not this, I don't know why this is up there, but yeah. <laughs> That's the actual computer, not the one before it. Uh, so basically what it is, it's a little mini computer that has the ability to process a bunch of information and everything, including arcade games and all those early uh, video games that you might have played growing up as a kid. So talking about the games, uh, there was a, a little bit of research that I had to do that I actually enjoyed doing because I could see how far video games have advanced from the early 70s. Uh, you have like your original Nintendo Entertainment System, your Atari 2700s, uh, and then moving on later in the years, you got your, like, your Sega Genesis, your Xbox, your Playstations. But this was actually the main fall, the main reason why arcades aren't around anymore, uh, which was something that probably shouldn't have happened because I thought arcades were really cool. Um, you can see, I just got some photos right here of some of the games that I do have. I've got like the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, Mortal Kombat, which I thought is really cool. And then I've got some more recent games from like the early 2000s, like Mario Kart 64 and Dragon Ball Z. Uh, so basically, why, why did I do this? I kind of thought that I could bring the two generations together because Long story short, I bought my dad this uh, replica, like, working Atari 2700, and he was like, I don't want this. i like, why don't, why don't you want it? I'm trying to, like, trying to bomb with you, trying to, trying to experience what you were like going, growing up. And he was like, no, this is trash. Like, I want to go play Xbox. I was like, all right. 
But uh, I just thought it'd be cool to bring both generations together to see how far uh, video games and everything have progressed since, I guess, the original release in the arcades and everything. But I also wanted to, for younger kids to appreciate everything that y'all had to go through growing up to see what awful stuff that y'all had to deal with. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. I want to thank y'all for y'all's time. And up next we have uh, Nathaniel Evans with Options. All right, so today I'm going to tell you guys a short, a short story about options. All right, so about like a year ago, I wanted to be multiple things, like a model, an actor, a clothing designer. And I thought to myself, what's stopping me from being all three of those things? And I came to the conclusion that what stopped me is that I have no determination to do any of those things because I gave myself all these reasons why I can't do something instead of reasons why I could actually do it. And that's why this year, I feel like my determination is higher. And I say that because, well, like I just previously said, I give myself reasons why I could actually do it instead of why I can't do it. And that's when I came to the whole concept of options, which is a clothing line that I actually designed from uh, start to finish, well, where I'm at now. And while making the clothing line, I came into two major problems which was one, learning how to sew, because I never knew how to sew or had to sew. So I looked up multiple videos on YouTube of, of how to tie a knot or finish a knot or anything I had to know about sewing, and that's how I was able to do embroidery for my hat uh, that I did by hand, because I didn't have an uh, embroidery machine. And the second problem was finding someone to print for me, because I contacted multiple companies and people, and I asked about prices for sewing, but, I mean, not for sewing, for printing, but the prices did not really match what I was looking for, and I would be losing a lot of money before I actually started gaining money. And that's when I told Mr. Golf about it, and he told me there was a past team member named Alex who actually owns a clothing line, and when I talked to Alex about it, he gave me a price that I couldn't beat, and I would be gaining money before I ever lost any money. So with that being said, at the stage now, I'm at a point where I'm designing multiple designs and logos, putting on shirts, and I ask people, like close friends or team members, about how they feel about the design, and if it's something that they find like appealing, I'll pick it for a shirt, but if it's something that they're not too happy about, I'll save it for later to probably tweak and have people like. And a major question that people might wonder or ask, like what changed from now and then, would be, instead of me giving myself all these reasons why I cannot do something, I give myself only reasons why I could do something. And that pushes me forward to completing any goal or dream that I want to accomplish. And with all that being said, we have next Tyler Melford with 3D Fun. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tyler Melford, and uh, today we're going to be showing you the presentation for 3D Fun that I've created. So, what are 3D models? 3D models are multiple surfaces that cr come together and make a three-dimensional image in specific software. So, what are the uses for them? So, we, uh, one, uh, some of the uses are for the medical field. For example, we do simulations of... Um, medical, like uh, surgeries without actually doing surgeries and explore the human body without actually cutting someone open. Another one, which is uh, building a house where you could um, go through inside, build the house without uh, actually building a house and blueprints, and you could actually go inside, change the paint, and put furniture in that you might like, and do all sorts of stuff like that, and one of our team members also did that as a project. And uh, another one is uh, building cars, where they model the car in a program and f put parts, suspension, engines, and all that, make sure everything fits before they make a clay model and put it in an aerodynamics test and make sure everything works. So what I did with a 3D model and uh, my basic knowledge of 3D modeling 
and I made a mod for a game called Spin Tires. And I have a reveal video for you guys if you, uh, right, uh, coming up next, and it's going to be for the truck I've created. So what do you guys think? So um, the programs I used for it was uh, SketchUp, which is on the top left here. And that, that's where I got the model and put it in, and exploded it so I could make it into separate parts so I could uh, separate it and make it, um, put in, exported it, which transfers all the files into 3ds Max, which is on the top right, which I took it and uh, grabbed the truck, put it, delete all the files that I don't need, create bones, which is uh, like uh, make the suspension animated and all that, and create a custom touches and add a CDT, which is the collisions for the truck. Then after that, I exported it into Spintar's editor, which I use to put textures, make sure everything's good, and, and uh, add sounds and all that. Then after that, I put it in the game. So from this, I've learned that um, I'm really interested in 3D modeling since I uh, started working on it. And I've really, really enjoyed it. And I would like to pursue it in later on as a career and all that. And now for the next presentation, which involves, and uh, excuse me, the truck, which uh, here, uh, I've worked on it for 3ds Max. and. Um, as you can see, this was one of the progresses I made where I put the suspension in and uh, animated it and put the CDTs on it and got everything ready for it to go in the game. So now for uh, Paul, I mean, Connor Loya for his uh, everything was uh, to start somewhere. Look at this art. It looks so cool. Like, I can't do anything like this. I can't even draw a stick figure. It looks just kind of awful anytime. I, I can't draw a straight line. So it, this kind of stuff always baffles me and seems amazing to me. And movies, too. I watch a lot of movies. Like all these Avengers movies coming out, Infinity War, I'm amazed all, with all that stuff. The, even the worst movies take so much time and effort to put into writing scripts, writing characters, acting. So much effort gets put into them, and that stuff kind of amazes me, and I just, I, I just wonder where all that talent comes from. Video games, I play a lot of those. This is The Witcher 3. This took like, like eight years of development, a lot of teams. It was a small team, too, actually. They, just a small town team, CD Projekt Red, put so much effort into this game. The graphics are beautiful. The world is amazing and immersive. Uh, the plot is intriguing, the characters are amazing, it's just so much talent. But like, me, I could, I just, it, all that stuff kind of makes me kind of feel insecure about myself, because I can't do anything like that. But I'm kind of confident in my ability as a human to think using my mind. Nothing like that can make, oh man. Look at that. that I can't even do that. Look, <laughs> did you see that in Monkey? That monkey, like, memorized all this. I can't do that. That's amazing. Just kind of makes me feel stressed out about everything. A monkey can do it, but I can't. What? It's amazing. But instead of thinking about all, like, the, uh, trying to think about all the amazing things people can do, I kind of try to ignore it sometimes so my head doesn't explode. And then I just kind of watch my life go by. As, you know, time goes by. I kind of don't get better at anything and just kind of stay the way I am. Then I just kind of worry a little bit harder instead of actually trying anything. Um, and then that's when like, I need to chill out, right? Because everything has to start somewhere. No one's born 
being amazing at everything. I actually kind of uh, found this thing of every idea that's ever been created by anyone on this next slide. It's empty. Every idea has to start from somewhere. Like, people aren't born being amazing at everything. Like, uh, Jimi Hendrix, okay, I had a mind blank there. Jimi Hendrix wasn't born one of the most amazing electric guitarists like, ever seen by man. He was, um, he first, like he went into the military, right? He didn't have the guitar with him. He had it sent to him because he wasn't playing it and he missed it. His people, his uh, military guys would hide it from him because it would distract them and he'd sneak out and he'd play it at bars. And he ended up getting honorably discharged from the military because he spent so much time trying to perfect his skill as a guitarist. He wasn't born great at it. Steve Jobs wasn't always the founder of Apple, one of the most powerful companies that we've ever seen. He was put up for adoption as a kid, and his uh, adoptive father, he put him in a, he gave him like a workbench accessible to him to try to instill kind of a, one of those mindsets in his mind to get him like, try to get mechanical passions. Now this stuff, it's not an easy path. You still have to practice and try really hard to get good at things. Like, I know that kind of sucks, right? But you have to try, I know, you kind of like, it's, it sucks, you have to try hard to do anything good, and it's kind of a thing. And then that's where I came in, like where I kind of apply to this. Because I've always liked video games, like I mentioned previously. I put so much time on my Xbox that I'm not comfortable sharing with y'all how much time I put on there. It's just a ridiculous amount of time on there. So I figured that I could try to make a video game because I'm passionate about that stuff. And so I went on Unity and all this stuff and I didn't know how to do any of this. It seemed alien to me. And then I was kind of like, wow, this sucks. I have to do work. I so much work doing all that. Like languages, uh, I can't program in computer languages that use C sharp, I didn't know how to do that. And, but there's no excuse to not try to do things because people have YouTube to look up all these things to do this stuff. They have Linda, which we have the satellite center. They have like hours and hours of educational videos to learn how to do things. And you also have Wikipedia, the Unity forums that I could have that I used on my project. Other people had the same passions as me. Went on there and they, you can ask questions and they'll come and solve your problems for you and help you and give you advice on what to do in your project. And you have all these things to do. There's no excuse to try not to learn something new. And then uh, this is uh, the the world that I kind of created in there, uh, using assets, all those things, that those files filled up. So many assets that I downloaded from various places across the website. And then t up there on the top right are scripts that I've had for the game. And uh, it, it got kind of complicated at some points because with the way computers work and it develops so quickly that like two months after a script is written, it becomes obsolete. So I had to look a lot of places to try to get working scripts for my things. And if it's like a year old, it's worthless and I can't use it. So it was kind of a problem, so I'm trying to learn to do all this stuff. These are more shots for my thing. Um, the, the style of the game I picked, I like shooters. I play those a lot. So I tried to make a first person kind of survival shooter fighting zombies and stuff, and that's what I kind of aimed to do at the beginning because that's what I was kind of passionate for. And in the end, I was, I was able to do this. And I'm, it's, it's just, it's, it was kind of eye-opening for me because I'm not at the beginning where I was kind of like, I can't do any of this stuff. I will never be able to make a movie, can't make a video game. It's just you have to put your mind to it and develop those skills throughout your life. It's not easy, and it sucks that it's not easy, but you have to work hard to be able to do something that you're going to be proud of. And at the end, I kind of felt confident what I was able to do. And thank you. But the next presentation we have is uh, Paul Parker with his Some Assembly Required. Now, when you look at media reviews, one of the most common things you see, or at least one of the most common things I see, is comparisons to other forms of media. Be it a book to a movie or a movie to a book, comparisons are everywhere in the review world of reviews. And something else I co most commonly see is this being viewed as a negative thing, either by the viewer themselves or the reviewer, or the reviewer. But why is this? When someone takes something from someone else, I view it as almost a form of flattery, personally. But this seems not to be too common of uh, opinion. I'm, I hope to change that a little bit today. One of the most common people, one of the most common groups of people affected by this is people that do fan art, people that create something out of something else. And uh, something that make it their own. Now let me put a pin in that for a second and talk about something else. Have you ever fallen, have you ever hated something so much that you sat down one day to experience it only to prove to yourself how bad it is, only to fall in love with it yourself? 
That's the story of me with Rebe and Rebecca Sugar's Steven Universe. The story itself enticed me. The story itself enticed me. The characters proved themselves to be quite entertaining for me. And so I was finally, I was hooked on the show. The show itself revolves around a young boy by the name of Steven, his three superpowered mother figures, and multiple galactic tyrants that are here to destroy Earth, really. To put it simply, at least. When I fell in love with the show, I wanted to make more of it. The show itself seemed limited to me, almost, and there was many loose strings that were in it. Things that were left hanging, things that would have larger impact on the world as a whole than what was let on by the show. So from there, I start, started to write. I created my own story, focusing around a new set of characters, new, new galactic tyrants that wanted to destroy Earth, and new heroes to save the day. From there, I took it further. I started a, dragon, a Dungeons and Dragons campaign around the story I created. For those of you who don't know, Dungeons and Dragons is a tabletop RPG game that focuses on player creativity and the solving of problems using their abilities. I got my girlfriend, my best friend, and multiple other people in on this, and they helped me build the story to what it really is today. From there, I took it even further. I went back to writing. I took it and I, uh, I cut down what didn't work, what was sloppy, inefficient, what didn't really put across the point of the story. From there, I continued on. And then this project came up. And, uh, and uh, my, uh, ugh. what came up was a project that would allow me to create, to put this story into a more interactable format for the common person. Not everyone is able to sit around a table at Dungeons and Dragons, you know? So, what I did was I made a game for it. First thing I did was the plot. I put down everything I had done for the entire game on paper. I had the beginning, the end, the middle, everything in between, all the factions, all the different characters, how they interacted with each other. Next up, I had to make graphics for my game. Now, this is a bit sloppy, but it, it was pixel art. I intended to make it completely two-dimensional, at least in terms of graphics, not the characters, of course. But. Continuing, continuing on, after I finished the graphics, I moved on to music. Each track, each track that I made was completely original, made by me. And now, at the very end, I was, it was time to put together my game, that I had every single thing I needed. And unfortunately, with so much that I needed to do, having time to put together the game that it was, was pretty difficult. The game that I intended it to be was pretty difficult. And to go back to the very beginning, this project as a whole has given me a whole new appreciation for not only people that make games themselves, but people that take from other worlds that already exist and make it their own. It showed me how difficult it was and really how great it can feel to actually do something for yourself. Thank you. And up next is Nicholas Creel with A Easier Way to Home. All right, so <laughs> I'm just gonna ask you guys a little simple question, all right? Now, have you guys ever had to build a little uh, project that requires you to use blueprints? Maybe like a house or maybe something in shop class that actually requires you to use blueprints or maybe something, uh, something more modern like software. And that's actually what I did. Instead of using a, that a tra traditional criteria of blueprints, I actually went into something more technological into 3D modeling. And I've actually made me a, a 3D model of a vintage home to actually help those who have a little bit of trouble in uh, designing uh, their home or maybe something that's quite similar to that. So this is actually the house that I worked on originally. And you can tell that it gives more of that vintage feel. And there's a little bit of a problem with it. And the most obvious is that since it's a two-story house, it doesn't have any stairs. So I thought, okay, how was I gonna work with this? So, <laughs> um, 
where I got the house, I got it off of a website called TurboSquid. And what TurboSquid is, is that it actually provides you um, many different models that you could look through. Um, also work on. And it, it, it could be like people, animals, objects, furniture, so on. Like the list just goes on. However, this website, I kind of faced with a few problems with it. And one of them was limitation. Now when you see this model right here, what do you think of it? A sink? A tub? Wrong. This is supposed to be a toilet. And <laughs> this really was, I, I mean, no words can describe, like, how can I actually work with this? I don't even know where to start off. And, then, and this is actually not the only thing that the toilet, I mean, like, it wasn't just, like, the toilet. It was just the couch. It was just everything. The, the list goes on. <laughs> so I actually had to figure out, okay, how am I going to make a toilet? Like, where am I going to make it at? So you can see right here, this is actually my version of the toilet that I made in a program called Blender. Now what Blender is, it's actually a computer program that allows you to start off um, uh, to model your shapes. And when you open it up, it, this is the first thing that you see. It's gonna, it can be a, like any shape. It could be a square, a cylinder. Um, also, uh, it gives you like many different essentials it provides you the many tools that you can actually work your shape to create that model. You can move it up, down, left to right, uh, side to side. So it was a fairly easy program to use. It took a while for me to like, okay, which tool does this? How am I gonna, you know, shape it? But um, after finally figuring out how I was gonna design the house inside and out, I finally came up with the final result. And you can see right here, there are a few changes, not just to the exterior, but also to the inside. And you can tell that I made a few changes to it, especially with the stairs that you can see right there. I made it all from scratch. It was uh, the most difficult. And that's not just it. It, can, uh, um, it was also the toilet, the sink, uh, the tub, uh, the refrigerator and the stove, and also some of the other, mo other models uh, that were actually a little bit more detailed. I got that off of TurboSquid, and okay, I thought I could work with that. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> um, so, I'm going to introduce you guys to Bailey Fabora, and don't discard your ideas. So Mickey Mouse is one of the most popular icons in pop culture. Now, what if he didn't exist? The first two Mickey Mouse shorts that he was featured in weren't originally that popular or successful. Now, what if um, Walt Disney just chucked Mickey in the trash? What if Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, which was also a previous Disney creation, became the one to fame? No one would really know about Mickey then. But Walt did not give up on Mickey, and he did Steamboat Willie, which was his third short, and it became super successful, and it's really iconic. And now Mickey Mouse is like a staple in the Disney brand. Now, do you have a bunch of ideas that are just sitting on the back burner? Until you do something with those ideas or create something with that, those ideas, then no one will really know about them, whether it be in the form of a comic book or a TV show. Now, I have a lot of ideas, specifically characters. I have made a lot of different characters over the years because I'm very creative and I like to express myself through art. But. I don't really do anything with them. I feel really bad for them, because nothing, like, I don't have a story to show off my characters at all. So, 
And also, I read web comics, which on this site called Webtoon, you can upload and read comics online. And I see everyone making these comics and using their ideas, and I get really inspired. So I decided that it was time to actually take my ideas and create something with them. So I made a 2D animation. Now, the animation itself, the story isn't that complex. It's about two witches fighting a monster. And, but it was really the first time that I actually created something with my characters and used my own ideas. So this is just a bunch of different clips. Now I had to start character designing, so I had a bunch of characters to choose from, and I specifically picked um, Faye and Willow and Knox. But Faye and Willow, they've actually been around for about four years. They've gone through many different phases, so I had to take a lot of their previous designs and make it very animation friendly. And since I've had them for so long, that I've really built up their story. So I took their story and put it into a script. And then I also made some storyboards, which storyboards are basically a visual script. But the next step, me and my friend Abigail Whitney, we actually voiced the two main characters in the story. And that really brought the characters to life. And then I actually started animating in Photoshop. And as this is just a sort shot where she's just standing up. And as you can tell, there's a lot of different frames that go into it. Because I did frame by frame animation, which means I drew every single frame. And it was very tedious. And honestly, it, I struggled a lot. Like, I got really burnt out because a lot of animation is just the same thing, just drawing a bunch and doing a lot of work. So I got really tired. And but if I gave up on my ideas, or like just chucked them out because it was too hard, you know, no one would know about my ideas or my, my story and my characters. So I was really motivated to create something with my characters. So you should really focus on your own ideas and develop them and really just don't throw them away at all because you don't like them. Okay, now we have the secret complexity behind video games with, by, with, with Edward Barranco. Now, I, I know we talked a lot about video games today, and I just want to ask you a question about one. What do you think when you hear the words video game? Do you think of enjoyable entertainment for ages young and old? Do you think of a hindrance on young minds? What about even uh, an excuse for when people are feeling lazy? How about digital art that's compounded of thousands of models and textures that's built with uh, millions of lines of code to bring to you what you see on your screen at home. Video games now are getting more and more complex on a yearly basis. Um, so much that even a five year span makes video games feel, act, and uh, even look completely different than they ever were before. So let's go back to 2006. Not that long ago, right? Wrong. 11 years in the video game industry is the equivalent of 100 years in the real world. This is because of all the technological advances and all of the improvements that the world has seen um, to build better games and to make them more complex. So today we will be comparing two, two games. We'll be looking at Prey from 2006 and comparing it to its reboot from 2017. The original Prey was very technologically advanced for its time as it's used techniques uh, that was very rare or even first time seen for video games, such as teleportation, gravity, and fully interactable scenes. In total, 35 people worked on this game. It was set on a single alien spaceship and it was in standard 1080p, which means that there are 1,080 pixels on your screen at one time. Now we'll be comparing it to the, the game's reboot that was released last year. 
This game, this game had 150 people working on it compared to the 35. And it was set on an entire space station than, rather than just a single ship. And it had 4K capabilities, which means that it had 2,160 pixels, which is double the previous game. Now, I'm not just going to tell you these facts. I'm also going to show you them. Here in the uh, original Prey game, you see the fully interactable bar scene in the beginning of the game. An alien spaceship is starting to abduct you and everybody inside the bar. You can see gravity affecting all the NPCs and the players in the game. And as you rise up, you, you can uh, also see aliens starting to teleport into the bar. Now let's look at the game's reboot. You, you see inventory as the player is picking up items. You also see gravity as the player throws things across the room. And you see an entire 3D environment outside the window just to find out that it is just a room behind it and it, the power of technology showed it, it um, hid, hid the room behind it, I guess. Um, so all this was done and all this was accomplished be only because of the technological advances that were seen in the 11 year span. And this brings me to my project. This is a video of my 3D environment, and it is because of the, the game such as Prey that it really made me want to create this and get the feel to build today's video games. And I just wanted to uh, future today's graphic capabilities, also with uh, just technological advances that are also seen in today's games. And, it, and it's my passion to became, become a game developer, which is why I wanted to create this, is because, again, I just wanted to create tomorrow's game today. Thank you. All right, so real quick, I'm just gonna give everybody that presented just one big more round, one round of applause. Did a great job. Uh, I'm going to release, I'm going to get them to release and go back to the room to set up real quick. Uh, I'm going to give them a couple of seconds to finish setting up. We had a different schedule today. Destra hands on a totally different schedule than Hanville, so they only had like 10 minutes to get prepared when they walked into school. Um, I want to give you a little background on what happened with this project. So a 20% project is something that Google started years ago. Uh, they gave their employees 20% of time to work on a passion project. A lot of their products that you use today have come out of that. One of the coolest I saw uh, that we looked at was at Google. They, when they were doing the Google Maps, do Google Earth, and mapping for Google Earth. Well, okay, they used to ride in cars and they have the little thing on top of the cars and they say, but how do they get like a desert? You know, you can't, they don't put like rally cars out there and get them stuck. They actually have a guy walking out there with a backpack on and the little camera up on top and he's walking through the desert, camels going by. Uh, it's pretty cool to watch. And like a lot of this stuff is born out of that. And so we wanted to give people, oh, another cool one. If you ever want to go look this up, one group did a 20% project. It was a documentary on all the other 20% projects at Google. Really cool. Um, so I wanted to give them a passion project. They spend a lot of time working for a client working on maybe something the district wants, working on something we want to do in class for a curriculum uh, to make sure they get everything they need. But I wanted them to have the ability to do something they were completely passionate about, and that's why they picked the different topics. That's why you see such a wide variety, because they want to go in a lot of different ways. So the idea was to spend about seven weeks on a passion project that had a technology twist. And that was the only, the only limitation that I put on them. And so it could have been anything. And then we spent about a week breaking down, and, uh, breaking down TED Talks. So how does a TED Talk work? Uh, how, do they make, how do they get their big idea out there? And we have all these tools to kind of break it down. And then they've been spending the last couple of days presenting. So they really have only had one week to not only break them down, but start building a presentation. Oh, and in the middle of that, try to get their visuals ready too. So. Uh, They've done that in about a one week's period of time and then set up an, a way for them to showcase. And so that's what you're gonna go down and look at now. They're all gonna have their products out. I will warn you right now, we had a little bit of problem with the VR. So not, it's not gonna be the full VR experience that we had earlier today. There's a problem with uh, 
you, uh, Unreal Engine right now and our system. So we're trying to get that worked out. He's down there figuring out how to, how to fix it, but we only had 10 minutes to figure it out earlier. So um, you might see a scaled down version of what it, so it, it may not be the top quality that, that it could be. So I just want to warn you on that. Uh, other than that, all the products are out there. What I want you to do is just we're going to go down to the interactive media room. If you can go, I know some of you have to leave, but if you can go, go down, go check it out. It's a free-for-all. Ask them questions, play with it, uh, you know, their products, and um, you know, just talk to them about their process, I guess. Thank you all for coming out. I really appreciate it. And all of these folders have like hundreds of stuff. I don't know who her dad is. What's his ad? Um, I changed the design.